Okay, take two. My name is uh, Dr. Christopher Dusing. Uh, I earned my doctorate in clinical social work from the University of Pennsylvania. I am a dialectical behavior uh, therapist, uh, DBT. I also have proficiencies in uh, contemporary psychoanalysis and also heavy interest in existential and humanistic psychology. I've been uh, organizing these events uh, the past few months. I think this is about the fifth or sixth one that we've done. And in these events, I'm really trying to capture uh, the spirit of dialectics, uh, with dialectics being bringing together two opposing schools of thought or two opposing poles of thought that might seem opposite, but upon deeper reflection are complementary. So in these presentations, I've been bringing things together like modern psychoanalysis and DBT, schema therapy and DBT, existential therapy and DBT. And this week, I'm really happy uh, to bring on two uh, somatic experts, two uh, body experts in terms of speaking about the body side of the mind-body connect. So the format will be, I'm going to turn it over to our somatic experts, uh, Sarah uh, Genke and also Amy Hagstrom. They're going to present for some time uh, and educate us about polyvagal theory and various other somatic elements. And then after that, I'm going to spend a little bit of time tying it into DBT talk therapy, uh, traditional kind of therapy up here. And after that, the three of us will go round robin for a bit. And once we get through that, then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. All right. Sound good? Sounds great. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll okay. leave it to you, Sarah. Go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Dusing. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today, this afternoon, wherever you're coming in from. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. So it is five o'clock here. And yeah, I'm just really excited to talk to y'all, all of you today about um, somatics and therapy. So I'm a nervous system and resilience coach. I'm specialized in a somatic tool called TRE, which stands for tension and trauma releasing exercises. Don't worry if you don't know what that is. We will definitely be getting into that a little bit later. And um, I'm here to talk a little bit about that somatic, a somatic experiencing along with Amy. So to be clear, I'm not a therapist, but I do work with individuals and groups to help them master this modality so that they can get some self-agency back when it comes to their healing modalities and healing process. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Amy to introduce herself and we'll get the show on the road. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited and really nervous to be here. Um, so thank you, Dr. Jusin, for inviting me. Um, I am both a therapist who incorporates somatic modalities and tools and a somatic coach. And in my somatic coaching, I work exclusively with the mind-body connection. I got into this originally when I struggled with my mental health and talk therapy and meds just really wasn't doing it for me. And it was first adding yoga um, that made a really, really big difference for me. So I got certified in yoga and then I became a massage therapist. And then I got my master's in social work at the same time that I got trained in something called somatic experiencing. And somatic experiencing is really the foundation of everything that I do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I also do something called safe and sound protocol. It's a listening therapy. And Stephen Porges, the creator of polyvagal theory, is the one who created that. And that's designed to bring safety into the nervous system. Um, I want to really briefly talk a little bit about my experience, my somatic experiencing right now, because I am nervous and many people experience nervousness with public speaking. Um, a lot of you are probably home from your day at work and might be having a somatic experience yourself. So I'm experiencing a little bit of shakiness here. And this is also something that I would do with my clients at the beginning of sessions, during sessions. 
um, while they're speaking and I'm noticing a little bit of activation and then I invite them to go into their body and, and see what they notice, see what comes up. I'm experiencing some heat in my face and some energy back here. So what I'm going to do with myself while I walk all of you through is a little bit of grounding and orienting. So I'm going to invite all of you to just feel the surface that you're on right now. If you're on a chair, you can feel the chair underneath you. You can feel your sit bones and your pelvis on the chair. And I'm going side to side a little bit to really feel the sit bones. If you're leaning against the back of a chair, you can feel the support of it. And sometimes you notice, nope, I'm not letting that chair support me. And that's totally okay. All of it, all of it is okay, whatever it is. If you have an armrest and you can have your arms on an armrest, then you can feel that, that contact there. So grounding in the somatic experiencing terms is just really noticing that contact with the surface that you're on. If your feet are on a surface, whether it's on your chair, on the floor, one foot on the chair, you can notice that contact as well. And as you're doing this, you might notice that you're still and you wanna be still, or you might notice that your body wants to move or adjust or stretch. And if you can allow yourself to do whatever it is that your body's wanting to do. And sometimes my go-to when I'm feeling a lot is to place a hand on my heart, hand on my belly, sometimes a hand behind my neck. It's really tuning into what works for you because we are all so different. Our nervous systems are different. Our experiences are different. And we're different throughout the day. We're different day to day. And the next thing I'll invite you to do is take a look around the room and let your eyes go wherever they want to go. If you notice things you don't like, you can keep looking. <laughs> Sometimes I invite my clients to notice things that they've never noticed before, and it, that could end up being a shadow or a little tiny mark on the wall. And see if you can still notice the chair while you're doing this. And I just noticed a deep natural breath come in. So my system is starting to feel a little bit more safe now. Those, those natural spontaneous deep breaths are a sign of some deactivation there, that stress energy, deactivating some safety in the system. Yeah. You might want to notice your breath, notice where it lands, notice if it's shallow or deep, it's all okay. All right. And I think we'll probably start off with some polyvagal theory. Does that sound good, Sarah? Let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hold on a second. There we go. Everyone see my screen? I can see your screen. Yeah. Do you want me to give a little bit of background here? Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Stephen Porges created polyvagal theory. He is a scientist and he was doing something while in school in the NICU. And the old way of thinking was that we have a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system, fight or flight or rest and digest. 
And he, he was noticing with these NICU babies that there were NICU babies that died when they were in parasympathetic. And it was like, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. And what he discovered is that the parasympathetic, which is the vagus nerve, is actually made up of two branches. What we tend to think of when we think of the vagus nerve and parasympathetic is rest and digest, and that's the ventral. So I have a hand that's just below my, just at my diaphragm. It's the top part. And that is that green part down there. When we feel really good and connected with people, we feel grounded and we can think really clearly and come up with creative ideas. The other branch of the vagus nerve is the dorsal. And that's a really, really, really ancient system. And that is a system of pure survival. It's, it's shutting down. So if you think depression or dissociation, and what we're doing is conserving energy there. The whole point is to conserve energy. So that's really, really different from what we think of as parasympathetic and rest and digest. Gets a little bit complicated because sometimes we have both on board if we're cuddling a baby, if we're just cuddling that stillness but we have to have that social engagement, the ventral vagal on for that to feel safe. And a lot of people who have experienced trauma do not feel safe with stillness. It feels awful, it feels horrendous. And that's because there isn't any ventral on board. So Stephen Poor just created this theory that includes that collapse. A lot of people say fight, flight, freeze. I love this chart because it shows freeze as being actually a combination of fight and flight and, and collapse. And that's this. Think a deer of like a deer in headlights. You're all amped up. You're not moving. Like all amped up, amped up and nowhere to go. Your body just doesn't feel safe enough to go. Yeah. Do you have do you have anything you want to to add to the basics of that, Sarah? Yeah, uh, you did a, a wonderful job explaining that. So when I talk to people about polyvagal theory, I really just like to point out a couple of things. One that we want to live in social engagement. When when we are open and curious, we can experience joy and really be grounded in that safety. And so. The tool that I use and the tools that Amy use really help us come back down this activation curve back into social engagement so that we can live a life of peace and ease. So what happens is when we get triggered by some external thing, or maybe it's something internal, we get, we get alerted in this like light lime green. And then if the threat continues, we start to move up that curve into that fight or flight, which is what Amy was talking about. If we can't fight our flight, then we move into the freeze. And then if that threat persists, then we'll get into that dorsal vagal. So a lot of people are unknowingly living in these heightened states. And that can come across as these various different emotions or behaviors, which none of them are necessarily bad. They're here, like Amy said, to protect us, to create longevity for our own lives and that we don't pass However, when we get stuck in these states, that's when we're going to experience some really adverse side effects, such as what you see here on the, on the right-hand side. So increased heart rate and blood pressure. Um, yeah, the, the list goes on. I won't list all of it, but um, that's basically what I would add. Yeah, and sometimes people oscillate between fight or flight and then shut down. And it's living these cycles of on. And the reason why we go to, sh to, to collapse and shut down is it's too much. If we're on high, 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 our system can only handle that for so, so long. We're going to shut down. Like we just can't do it anymore. We need to preserve energy at that point. And we need all of this. We, it's, Sometimes it's it's appropriate to be mad, 
But we want to be, in, and this is going to be another chart that we pull up, we want to be in our window of tolerance. We want to be able to have enough safety on board that we're not lashing out, that we're not doing something that's going to get us in trouble or affect our relationships. And many of us are living in this place where we're, we can't, we're outside of that window of tolerance. And if you Sarah's looking for it. Yeah. And that's this chart really speaks to the, the oscillation, the up and down, up and down. It's a real, it's really hard to live like that. And it's really hard on our systems. And the more and the longer that we're there, the more we're going to start to experience health problems because of it. Because it has to all of that stress has to go somewhere. Something has to happen with it. And then we end up seeing things like fibromyalgia. We end up seeing a lot of digestive issues. So if you have a lot of digestive issues, it's a really safe bet to say that there's a lot of dorsal vagal because dorsal vagal is below the diaphragm. It's it, the vagus nerve there innervates with your digestive system. So if that is on and, and um, there's, there's likely going to be a lot of digestive issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is widen with the work that Sarah and I do mm -hmm. is, is working on widening that window of tolerance. So you can take on more and more stress. There was a time where, so I've been nervous about this and I'm, and I'm here. There was a time where the nerves would have like, I would have darted like, no, not doing this because I would have either had an extreme flight response or just shut down. Mm. Yeah. And like, Amy, that's so vulnerable and brave of you to come out and say that. I think that actually a lot of people experience that. I know I've experienced it in my past as well. Um, and a lot of us are probably leaders on the call. And so um, when we have to give a presentation in front of our team or the executive team, just know that what's happening within your body is totally normal. It's a natural reaction. And so within that, you can find some safety and, and know that what's happening is totally okay. And with that, Amy and I are really on this mission to tell people about this. This is really ultimately what being trauma-informed is, is learning about the nervous system and how that shows up in our day-to-day, -day, whether it's professional or personal and so when people talk about resilience work, this window of tolerance model, that is really what resilience is. It's a mental and physical muscle that we're lifting to grow that window. Um, just to share a tidbit about my life, at one point in, in time, my window of tolerance was really, really small and I got triggered super easily and I would just immediately take what my therapist would say, like that escalator straight up to uh, one of the trauma responses. And um, by the way, we have different trauma responses in different contexts, and we can get to that in a little bit. Um, but through working on my resilience, through meditation and mindfulness and really TRE, TRE was the key for me that unlocked a lot of things and everybody's body's different. There's different modalities for different people. Um, I just, I'm on that mission of trying to bring TRE to others because I know um, if it worked for me, it's got to work for some others. And so that's really what resilience work is about is growing that window of tolerance. Yeah. And Sarah and I have talked a lot about how bringing the body and the nervous system into it does a lot to reduce shame because you understand that these are physiological things that are happening you understand that, and I don't know how, how much, I guess we've talked about it a little, our brain and body is trying to protect us when our, so it's our amygdala that picks up threat. And depending on what we've gone through in life, it may pick up threat that's not really there based on us. You never know what it's going to be. It could be a smell. It could be the look on somebody's face. It could be a tone of voice. 
there are so many things that could be a trigger for the amygdala to pick up threat. And when it does, it sends messages down to the brainstem to go into fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. And we don't get to decide which one of those happens. And so when we understand that this happens like that, it starts to reduce the shame and the understanding. I remember years ago, I just didn't understand why my mood shifted like this. And having this knowledge really helped me gain the understanding. And then once you understand and you do this work, you start to be able to gain a sense of control and widen that window and learn what your system needs to have safety on board and learn what your system needs to have enough safety on board so that you can listen and pay attention to these cues and to be able to be present with your body's cues. Mm, Yes. And on top of that, I'd say that people that experience complex trauma over a long period of time, when they are in that fawn response, which Amy, I want to get into, into that with you here momentarily, um, you know, we end up putting our own needs aside. We are constantly on, on alert. We're overwhelmed. We're in that heightened state in our nervous system. We are um, always looking out for those threats, reading the room, analyzing everybody's little behaviors, or like you said, facial expressions and interpreting that and trying to calculate in your head, like, is this because of me? And it's really it's really coming from a place of trauma. And so um, when we do this work, we slowly can release that so that we can then start to notice those cues. Cause I would say that people that are living in those states, they they can't notice those cues. They can't put themselves first because they're putting other people's needs, behaviors, reactions first so that they can then feel safe. But um, Amy, let's talk a little bit about fawn. I don't know if a lot of people know about it. Um, I, I'm happy to give my two cents after you you uh, chip in here. Yeah, you go ahead first. Oh, uh, okay. So <laughs> um, fawn is, I guess I would label it as a trauma response. Others would say it's kind of separate, but essentially it is a combination of all of the trauma responses. And my personal take on it is that that can only formulate when we've experienced complex trauma or stress over an extended period of time, such as from childhood. Amy, what do you have to add? Uh, I mean, the only thing I would say is people tend to say fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And I just don't include it in there because it's not one of those nervous system states. It's not a nervous system state, whereas fight is a nervous system state freeze is a nervous system state. I think there's still a lot to learn about about fawn, but I do believe it's a combination of this the state and it's a way to keep yourself safe. And and it often develops young when a child has to keep really aware of the environment and the relationships and their role in relationships and the relationship and what they need to do to keep themselves safe. And I think often our brains are lower brain structures. So the emotional brain and the brainstem, they don't know, they don't know time, space and time. So they don't know if you're actually safe, if the cues and, and we get, we get cues that are internally, internal internal to our body so that is called interoception externally so that's the environment and then relationally and that fawn comes in through relationally relational and that often develops young or that starts to get really sticky at a at a young age Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well said well said yeah I guess I haven't really talked much about somatic, like the two things. Do you want to say more about TRE? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I can jump in now or I can go after you, but, oh, what does fawn look like? We've got a question. Um, Again, that people pleasing, peas in a please, um, trying to make everyone happy in the situation, putting your needs kind of last. 
that's kind of what that looks like. Like just not even knowing what your needs are. True. Having lack of boundaries, not having, not having a sense of self or identity as well. Those kind of go hand in hand. I know that I'm still unpacking. That could lead into like a classical, that could lead into like a classical, that borderline presentation of identity diffusion, where one is constantly organizing oneself around others. And then all of a sudden the center doesn't hold. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Amy, please. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to talk about TRE? Let's do it. So uh, TRE, again, it stands for tension and trauma releasing exercises. It was developed by a man named Dr. Berselli, David Berselli. And essentially this came from when he was working in war zone countries where um, he was all in bomb shelters with a variety of different people, young, old. And so after when a bomb would go off, everyone would kind of curl forward in that, in that fetal position, like choreography. But after the bomb went off, he noticed that there was a big difference between the adults and the children. And he noticed that the children shook after, but the adults did not. And so he got really curious around that and asked the adults, like, why aren't you shaking? And it wasn't that they couldn't shake. It was really more so about them wanting to feel like they had to hold it together for the adults, you know, hold it in, not look weak or weird or vulnerable. And so essentially Dr. Berselli, when he came back to the States, he unpacked that, reverse engineered it and got us to essentially come out of that trauma. Because if we can go in it, into trauma, there has to be a way to come out of it. And we didn't talk our way into trauma. We felt our way into trauma. So we have to feel our way out of it. And so hence TRE was born. What it is, essentially, it's a way for us to release deep muscular patterns of stress, tension, anxiety, and trauma from the body, which gets stuck and stored in us. And there's in total seven exercises. We've got six intro exercises, which lightly stretch muscles and then lightly fatigue them. So we can tap into this innate shaking or what I say, tremor. <laughs> yes, I just said tremor, <laughs> tremor mechanism, which releases that stress and anxiety and trauma from the body. And so it's changed my life. Um, I came across it three plus years ago. I took a class at my gym and thought it was really weird. I was like, why are these people flopping on the ground? Like, this is just absurd. But something within me really was just like, Sarah, you got to keep going. And I'm so glad I, that I did because when I, when I finally tremored and felt safe enough with myself to do it when no one else was around, it clicked. And then I just leaned into it over the pandemic. And so just about over a year ago, I embarked on my my TRE certification process, got certified at the beginning of this year, finalized that nine, seven month process. And now I work with individuals to help them, individuals and groups, I should say, to help them not only learn this tool, but really give them that self-agency back that gets lost as we go through trauma from having to constantly put other people first and not worry or and not worry about ourselves. So that's a little bit about TRE. There's more I could talk about, but I'll just pause there. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll talk about somatic experiencing now. So somatic experiencing was created by Dr. Peter Levine. Um, he studied animals and neuroscience, animals in the wild. And he discovered or noticed that animals in the wild don't experience trauma, at least that we know of, or there's very few. And what happens with us is we start to live up here. We start to ignore the cues, not be in our body and not notice. And kind of like what Sarah was talking about, when we go through something that's too much too quick for our nervous system, we don't allow the time and the space for us to integrate that, to let the body respond, to let the shaking respond, to even be supported by another human being with, with what our needs are there. So somatic experiencing is not one of those things where it's easily like tidied up in a nice bow with how you explain it. But what you're doing is renegotiating trauma and you're getting renegotiation in the nervous system because often 
we have responses that are really big for what the situation is, or maybe it's at night, you can't sleep, your system is on and on alert. So we're helping the nervous system renegotiate and to be more appropriate in, in situations. So what I do is while a client is talking, I am looking for activation in the ner their nervous system, whether they're going up to a fight or flight and they're talking really fast and their eyes are really big, um, or they're starting to shut down, I'll ask them if it's okay to notice what they're feeling in their body. And we spend time there and we do something called pendulation where we go in that thing that doesn't feel very good and we go out into resourcing and we spend lots of time discovering what is resourceful and it's different for everybody. And then, okay, is it okay to go back? to what didn't feel good or that story or to see if those sensations are still there. And we start to develop flexibility in the nervous system. And we let the nervous system know that it doesn't have to get stuck in that place, that shutdown or fight or flight, that we can move in and out of the place. And then we start to get it. We don't always go to sensation, but sensation is an important part of it because in our society, most of us aren't taught. We're just not taught to tune into our bodies, to notice tightness, to notice heat, to notice squiggly feelings. And so we start to learn that landscape and get more comfortable with it and build tolerance of being with discomfort and to really widen that window of tolerance. So not easily explainable, but that's a little bit about what some of somatic experiencing looks like. And then I'll briefly talk about safe and sound protocol. Stephen Port just created this as a passive way to bring safety into the nervous system. So client doesn't have to do anything but put on headphones and listen to music. And the music is filtered to bring safety into the nervous system. So it actually filters out the low notes because our systems take in the low notes as threat. And we listen to just a little bit at a time, getting to know the client's nervous system and their capacity. And sometimes there's a little bit of a reaction to that. And that's where I bring somatic experiencing. Um, if they listen and they notice a little bit of irritation come up, then we work with that and with the body, with tuning in, sometimes with movement, sometimes with things like pushing on a wall. There's all kinds of things that we do um, in this work, but ultimately, ultimately, it's allowing the system to bring in more and more safety. We had something in the chat. Uh, will we do a somatic practice today? I don't know. <laughs> do you do you have anything? Well, perhaps some. Oh, uh, uh, do you have anything else before I drop in for a little bit and kind of sprinkle a little bit of DBT and. Uh, what I'm seeing here is kind of some overlap and intersectionality. All, all yours. <laughs> okay, and then, uh, and then perhaps after that, uh, we can do a, a brief somatic practice. Well, we can ping pong a little bit after I'm done and after it soaks in a little bit with you and Sarah and you, Amy, and then we'll do a short somatic practice and then open it up for Q&A. Sound good? Can I get that, um, that um, the vagus nerve, uh, the hump, uh, put on the uh, graph here? Polyvagal theory, yes. Polyvagal theory, yes. So, so I find this fascinating, actually, and this transposes really well on a DBT model. I originally was going to talk just about the distress tolerance module, uh, which applies, I would say, to this shutdown collapse 
staged. This is really nice because we can transpose the DBT modules on this. I would say when we're in social engagement, the ventral vagal, uh, the safety, that green zone, this is where we are acting from module of mindfulness. So we're just trying to stay present and move through our daily life um, and just live a life worth living. However, it's interesting when we go up to this yellow stage, uh, it's almost like the protocol that I go through even in my own practice of, okay, now we have like some frustration, irritation, uh, maybe I got cut off while driving to work and I'm feeling a bit of anger, maybe bordering on rage. This ties in directly uh, to foundational DBT skill of observing and describing your emotions and gaining emotional fluency. Uh, so in addition to being able to identify where we are at physically, we can start to see how identifying, observing, describing, and being able to locate our emotions uh, can help orient us and give us a bit of a sense of mastery and agency in terms of, okay, now I'm in a yellow zone. So this is the zone, and I'm not gonna go through an extensive DBT training because that would take way too much time, but this is the module where I would say emotional regulation skills are applying. This is, so what emotional regulation skills are we using? Are we using observing and describing? Uh, are, are we trying to uh, accumulate positive emotions, which we might even be able to do in the social engagement uh, sphere? What are we doing in terms of accepting our emotions as they are, letting them breathe, describing them to ourselves? And really, can we hold the line there? Now, if we start to get into rage and panic, and we're right on that edge there where it says the freeze hybrid of sympathetic and dorsal vagal uh, nervous system here, this is where I was going to talk about the distress tolerance module. And the distress tolerance module is actually my favorite module in the DBT um, curriculum. It all starts uh, with the stop skill. So I'm sure there's some DBTers in here. Can anybody, well, who can explain the stop skill to me in about 45 seconds? I see Christina smiling. Are you my ace in the hall? No? Okay. I, I can be, I can be. I, I Yeah, that, that yeah, works. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so Please. essentially, the, I mean, the way that I teach the stop skill to my clients is to help create distance between um, stimulus and reaction. And a lot of the times it's, I'm experiencing something and I'm gonna react in a lot of it's impulsivity. So it, when there's triggers, we teach them to stop. And it's pretty simple because it basically just means, so it stands for stop, take a step back, observe and proceed mindfully. Um, again, don't act, remove yourself slightly from the situation, describe, notice what's going on, use that wise mind to then make your decision. Is that short enough? Okay. Yeah, it's a great setup. Um, I actually uh, simplify the stop skill. I try not to make it a, a word skill in terms of thinking of what the acronym is. Uh, my conceptualization of the stop sign is all you are doing is picturing a bright red big stop sign and you are obeying it uh, mm. by inaction. Stop, right? The S stands for stop, freeze, don't do anything, right? If you're feeling dissociated or helpless or their suicidality, you're in a deep shame spiral, perhaps you're feeling an urge to cut or self-harm behaviors, stop. If we can jam our foot in the door of this kind of line between the yellow and the red, this is kind of a zone that a lot of maturation and growth can come into. A lot of people view mindfulness as the skill where we are in the ohm zone where we're meditating, where we're nice and level, right? I actually view mindfulness, I call it emergency room mindfulness. This is my concept, right? This happens at this stage where we are trying to stop, right? And then take a breath. Christina, I actually call it the stutter stop skill because before we get to the O and the P, which is observe and proceed mindfully, oftentimes we need to stop, take a breath, stop, take a breath stop, take a breath, 
until we can access a little bit of our executive function uh, and, and be able to just breathe and then observe and proceed mindfully. I oftentimes start with teaching people not about the green mindfulness skills in terms of we need to meditate, we need to kind of observe and describe our emotions. I say when we're getting heated or we're in that zone where we are going to harm ourselves or others, we need to stop. And then I build everything out from there. Right. Um, other things I love about the distress tolerance module, it's a very physical module. So what I mean by that is with the emotional regulation skills, when we're in this yellow zone, it's more of observing and describing uh, and trying to do um, lighter things to, uh, to modulate our emotions. When we get to this red zone of distress tolerance, and this is actually where the original Lanahan formulation of distress tolerance, she called it crisis survival strategies, which I actually find much more um, accurate. We are trying to survive the crisis. And that actually ties into a lot of people view resiliency as a bounce back. Like a person is resilient if they are able to bounce back immediately uh, with speed from a prompting situation. I actually view resiliency as uh, can we survive? Can we tread water? Uh, can we do the dead man float? In, in the water when we are extremely, uh, extremely triggered and activated. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the skills that embodies the distress tolerance crisis survival strategy is called the PIP skill. I'm uh, gonna ask another, is there another dbt -er in here? I, I think Allison's in here. Allison, can you teach us the PIP skill? In about uh, 45 seconds, I would say focus on the T and the I. Yeah, so can you hear me okay? Yeah, so, um, the tip skill is like skills breakdown skill, how we teach it. Um, T stands for temperature. Cold is talked about the most, but also we talk about how hot temperature is sometimes relieving as well. And then I, I like to say intense movement. People don't always resonate with the word exercise. And then the first P is paced breathing. Second P is progressive muscle relaxation. And like I said, with the skills breakdown point, that's where we suggest this skill because it is very short term. Like we can run cold water on our wrists for a good 30 seconds, feel good, and then feel like we're right back in it. So really emphasizing that it's not the end all be all. It's kind of like a, a little band-aid to help maybe reassess the stop skill potentially or pros and cons. So yes, be yeah, like, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead, Alison. Yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna say, and I like to tell people to get creative with it because the manual has its handout and suggestions. And I like to just encourage people to make it their own. Like not everyone can put their face in an ice bath. So I was actually gonna go kind of into that, some modifications that I have had patients do, and myself too, uh, especially now that we're getting into some colder weather, uh, you can underdress and take a walk outside and allow yourself to get cold, right? And that can shift your internal focus. We were talking about, um, what was the word that you used? Pendulation. Um, so we can kind of pendulate, shift our focus from a very internal uh, hyper triggered state to where our body's like, oh, I'm cold. All of a sudden, that can kind of shock us into the external focus. Uh, other, um, other remixes, uh, ice packs, cold ice packs on the eyes, right? A soda can, a frozen so soda can on the back of the neck, holding ice cubes in the hands, right? I even had a client who would lay uh, on their concrete driveway uh, no cars uh, driving around them, but they would lay there and let the cold seep up into their body from the ground. So again, very, very physical skills and using your environment, uh, changing your environment to kind of get back into your body. Again, at this point, at this shutdown collapse point, when we're using distress tolerance skills, we're just trying to buy some time because oftentimes too, a lot of the stress hormones, you know, cortisol, adrenaline, those take time to run through the body about 20, 30 minutes. So again, we're just trying to make it to the next minute, improve the moment. 
Uh, one of my clients uh, way back in the day had an interesting um, remix on the tip skill. They went the other way. When they wanted to cut themselves, uh, they got to the point where they would carry around really hot jalapeno peppers and they would eat one of the peppers and then focus on that. And it was amazing. Uh, that really, really cut down on, on, their, on their cutting um, episodes. Uh, just a short thing with intense exercise. Uh, the intense exercise, if you are upset or in the red zone, uh, I oftentimes encourage clients uh, to do two minutes of push-ups um, or whatever form of push-ups you can do. Do 100 jumping jacks. Run around the block. Uh, not does not have to be long, but high level intense exercise. Again, getting out of breath, getting flush, getting pers perspiration going. And then all of a sudden, again, we have that um, externalized focus, right? Did I miss anything there, Allison? Make an add on there. No, sorry, I'm eating. <laughs> oh, <got> good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those are some of my thoughts in terms of how DBT transposes upon this, in particular, the red zone with the distress tolerance module. Distress tolerance is not something we can stay in a long time. It is not um, an in perpetuity kind of module. We really want to use those skills. And a lot of, there's a lot of skills in DBT. Oftentimes clients really gravitate towards two or three core skills that they go back to over and over again. So in using the stop skill and then starting to skill stack, if we're using the, the, um, the tip skill, wise mind accepts, and we get to a point where we get to some of this deactivation, it's really nice then because once we get down to that yellow, then we can go to our emotional regulation skills and then coming back down to the green when we can expand and come back into social engagement, reconnect, then we can use our mindfulness and interpersonal effectiveness skills. So this is actually an incredible diagram uh, and, and I think integrates incredibly uh, with, with, um, with, with DBT. You know, the, the integratability of DBT as I continue to study it uh, just really, really uh, blows my mind. Uh, when we get to the deactivation too, and we're down to this social engagement and we're able to access our words, right? We come out of a, if we want to go completely psychoanalytic and go kind of into the red stage, uh, we're in complete regression. We're in a pre-verbal stage. Words don't exist. And we're able to kind of work ourselves down, back down the green. Then all of a sudden, we can put words to the experience. This is the time where we are describing, thinking about, perhaps accessing cognitions. What are the interpretations that led to such an escalation? However, we can't think ourselves out of the red zone. Right? And this is where I, I, I'm a huge believer in terms of the physicality, the body is the reality we need to be working with at that point. Right. Um, just some random notes here. This wider window of tolerance is a fascinating concept to me. Uh, this seems to be a core principle of DBT in terms of I view DBT as an exposure therapy with the skills uh, and mindfulness we are training ourselves to be able to move through life, to be exposed through life and all the triggers and situations that life is. I once had a client say that life is a trigger, right? If we can increase our window of tolerance with skills use, uh, with being able to use skills like the stop skill, also too, uh, increasing our window of tolerance in terms of increasing our insights, where our cognitions, uh, perhaps where our traumas come from, where our patterns come from, insight can increase that window of tolerance too and help us move through life uh, with emotional regulation. Oftentimes what I call emotional regulation, we're trying to get these, uh, these canyons, right? And, uh, and mountains here, right? We're trying to soften them up and lower them down to kind of where we're meandering uh, through valleys and meadows, right? Uh, so th that's, that, that really um, fascinates me, this, this window of tolerance um, aspect as well. I'll just say in, in closing with the DBT, you know, 
we can't act our way into new ways of thinking, or we can't think ourselves into new ways of acting. We can only act our way into new ways of thinking. That's a Lanahan quote. I, it's a very absolutist quote, and sure, I, there are exceptions. However, I really think it generally applies, and I think it really feeds well into these uh, somatic um, interventions. My hope is, is that I feel like somatics and talk therapy uh, or th therapy in general is bifurcated. It's separated. It's you as separate. Oftentimes in the past, I had been like, oh, well, you need to go do some somatic work. I'm going to go refer you uh, to a Hakomi practitioner, or I'm going to pr uh, refer you to somatic experiencing or other modalities. My hope is that uh, we can see more integration in the future where we have clinicians uh, who can do uh, elements of this stuff and really technically and proficiently integrate it um, into the treatment uh, so that we can have that happening both in the therapy session and also, too, when the therapy continues, uh, the real therapy really continues in between therapy sessions. And that's another thing that I love about DBT. With all these skills, when they get internalized, then um, the client leaves with an arsenal to be able to, uh, to widen their window of tolerance, recognize the zones, right, the green, yellow, and red, and be able to move through them. And when they can do that, a profound sense of mastery can occur. And with repetition uh, and neuroplasticity, we can rewire the brain. And when patients experience that type of profound and deep enduring change, uh, it's a magical thing to bear witness to. So, so that's uh, that's uh, my um, spaghetti against the wall there. Any uh, any reactions from uh, is it Sarah, or Amy? That was great. Thank you. I'm not as familiar with uh, DBT, so yeah. Anyone who's looking for a nice overview of DBT, I highly recommend. It's a very brief book, Calming the Emotional Storm by Sherry Van Dyke. Uh, please, Amy. No, I was just going to say that was great. And I can't think of anything to to add at this at this moment. Yeah. Oh. Wonderful, though. I, I really have to thank you for bringing that um, first chart in, because when that came up, I was like, ding, <laughs> there it is. So that was a lot. Uh, I know sometimes I get very excited and bring the intensity and the heat. Uh, so why don't we uh, uh, bring a brief um, somatic experience here that was requested for, and then we're at about 6.55. Um, why don't we go till 7 with that experience, and then we'll open it up for about 15, 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. Sound good? Did you have something, Sarah? Sarah yeah. Or do you yeah. want me to add in? Please and do an experience? Well, um, I if I went, I would just lead people through a simple grounding. Um, but why don't why don't you lead us, Amy? Okay. So um, I'll have people start just by feeling their chair. So get back into noticing that you have a body that it's on a chair or a couch or bed wherever you're at. See if you can tune into your, your pelvis, your spine, and with your spine, you might need to do a little bit of movement or take your hands if they can reach and feel it. And then I'm just going to walk you through a containment experience. And if you're not feeling like you want to be contained right now, then then you absolutely don't have to. I'm going to mirror you. Um, so you're going to take your right hand and you're going to place it by on your side. So it's going to be close to your heart. And then you're going to take your left hand and you're going to place it kind of here. So it's over the, the arm, the deltoid, the arm muscles. And then if your shoulders are up here, see if you can relax them. You can squeeze, you can rub. 
Continue to feel your chair and just notice the support of your hands. Notice the pressure of your arms against your chest. And if you need to adjust, feel free to adjust in any way. And this can be great when we need, and when we need containment, I don't know if you need a hug, you can give yourself a self hug. If you're feeling a lot of anxiety or if you're in that red, red zone and you need to feel that you have a body, this can help you feel that you have a body. And then you just, you just stay here. Yeah, you can, and you can move your hands. You can pat, you can lightly rub. Yep, and then I see people starting to move in other ways. And once you're there, you start to feel that you're in your body and continue to feel that you, you're on a chair or a surface. You can notice your feet and maybe wiggle your toes, your hands. A lot of times there's something childlike that happens when we notice our toes and we start to wiggle them. And then you may notice that there's a deep breath. You may notice that there's a bit of ease that comes into your system. And if it doesn't, that's absolutely okay too. Yeah, like Sarah's body is regulating. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah when there are yawns and in, in somatic experiencing if there's a burp if anything like that it's a sign that things are moving and getting unstuck yeah one last thing that I would like to say about that chart and that what we do in somatic experiencing is we work on a little bit of activation at a time so little bits of activation and then working on a deactivation with just a little bit so it doesn't become overwhelming in the system. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I was just saying that was lovely. Uh, you're right about the feet. Uh, when I moved them, I almost felt a little like child, like and a uh, smile came to my face. So I think too, that's another, we can get so serious about these things uh, and even DBT therapy. I really think there's an important part of playing that we have to uh, bring in here because we forget as adults to play. Yes, we do. When we play, we're in our ventral. Yes. Ventral vagal, parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. There's some sympathetic in there too, because we have to be able to move the body and mobilize enough if we're running or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah play is very healing. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, with that, uh, questions and answers. Uh, I'm not going to work from the chat. We're going to work with raising hands, uh, but we can start with the first one um, in the chat. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Sarah, Amy, are you familiar with art math at all? No. Okay. So, yes, now though. <laughs> Denise, perhaps, uh, you have to educate. Uh, heart math is interesting. Uh, Denise is one of my staff therapists, so uh, may have to educate um, our somatic experts here. So, okay, uh, floor is open for questions and answers. Denise. Wait, now I'm off mute. Yeah, so <clears throat> everything that I, I, you know, understand about what you were talking about, um, have you ever used the biofeedback device um, from HeartMath that uh, measures heart rate variability, which then through an algorithm will give you the state of your autonomic nervous system, whether you're, it measures the uh, balance of parasympathetic and sympathetic in a, uh, in a biofeedback uh, chart where you are 
put in the green, blue, or red zone. It's very similar. It's a breathing technique that you use. Um, and I actually want to try some of the, like the exercise that you just did with the biofeedback device on to see, you know, kind of the um, effects that it would have. But it's interesting to combine that, um, the biofeedback with, because it is all, it kind of all goes together. Yeah. I actually have heard of biofeedback and neurofeedback. I've recently started dabbling into some of that. So um, yes, would love to get my hands on a machine and and try that out. Yeah, it's well, if you go to heartmath.com, the inner balance um, device is very simple to use. And I actually have been with um, some of my clients who um, are using DBT, they're incorporating the biofeedback device when they're applying some of the skills. And it's really interesting to see what's happening. So I wonder if that would be an interesting blend with some of your uh, practices to see where how, how it's, cause it's, I had a few clients tell me they didn't know how good they were until they saw it, uh, through the biofeedback. They're like, well, I didn't really know I was in coherence. And then it gives them a touch point to go back to and know what the body felt like when it was, you know, fed back to them through the biofeedback. Well, oh, so that's what it feels like to be coherent. So yeah, just thought I'd share that, but it's all blends together. And I love all of what you were, um, saying. It's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's really, really cool. I do yeah. know that some people are working with um, measuring heart rate variability with safe and sound protocol. Um, makes a lot of sense to, to add that. Yeah, it's just interest. It's an interesting aspect of the nervous system um, to use heart rate variability. There's a lot of uh, science uh, studies on it. It's been a long time. Um, the Heart Math Institute has been researching for a long time about um, that part of the nervous system. So yeah, I love all this stuff. So thank you for bringing it out and, and all of the, because um, without, you know, getting back, I'm always trying to get everyone out of their head and into their body. So the more ways we can do that, the better. <laughs> so thank you. I just want to say that's, I love that that exists because actually Amy and I were talking about this mental health and navigating trauma is really complex and there's no like handbook for different experiences that people have. So if you can actually help them create a map and be able to point back to a point in time when they're experiencing something and they can reflect on it, I think that's really powerful for them. Yeah. Yeah. To have that touch point, because I think trauma creates this uh, disconnect to what it ever, it's almost like you can't remember what it felt like to be balanced and you might even yeah. have that, but you know, it's not a parent. So adding the different um, physical experiences into it, I think is a huge piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of the puzzle. <laughs> but thank you. This was awesome. Christina, Christina, you had your hand up? You're welcome. Denise. Yeah. yeah, I actually was going to mention something that Denise brought up as well. I was going to ask about neurofeedback tools mm -hmm. um, with this because a lot of the times when I'm working with clients who have severe trauma, I'm feeling the same way, right? I really want to get them to, they, they're so disconnected from their body is that they don't even know they're experiencing reactions. And even with DBT skills for them to even recognize that they need to use stop or tip or any of these other skills, it's just not there. And they'll tell me like, Oh, I'm just really impulsive. Or I just, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any triggers for anything. And I'm like, well, you do. I, they're just, and I'm seeing her shake, right. I'm seeing the shaking and like the restlessness and poor eye contact and stomach issues. And I'm like, there's got, we've got, there's gotta be some way to bring them to their bodies. But I guess I'm curious about, um, especially for people who've experienced sexual trauma or trauma, physical trauma, how to, I mean, I know that this is a huge, this is not something you can teach in like a couple of seconds, but I guess I would ask, where would you point me when it comes time to getting people in touch with their bodies when maybe they have an eating disorder and touching their bodies to even for themselves is not a fun experience, but knowing that if we don't do that, they're not going to be able to be, to recognize triggers and warning signs. So I'm wondering any advice on that? Yes. Sometimes in my work, we start outside of the body and we don't go there. We start with noticing the environment. We, and then maybe just even noticing the chair and that might be enough for, yeah. for, for that day we work on resources. So with SE, we spend a lot of time on 
what brings a little bit of ease into the system? What what might make you laugh? What was really pretty that, that, or interesting that, that you looked at? And some clients, I, I have said, okay, what do you notice in your body? And I never do that again with them because I just put that on hold because it's not necessarily, you know, we must be embodied. <laughs> You must go to your body. Some people just aren't there. And we really, really have to meet people where they are. You can't force it. If it doesn't feel safe, right? then we don't force it. Yeah, I love that, Amy. And I would say the same thing. I'd say that TRE is something that's a little bit deeper. It's for people that already have established a sense of safety within themselves to a certain extent that are a little bit more self-aware and are ready to take it to that next level and meet themselves deeper. Because if, like you said, if that safety is not there, they're not going to experience what they, what they're coming for, what they need. Sometimes we might work with playing with their strength. Um, maybe feeling what it likes to press your feet into the floor as I'm doing right now. We do a lot of pushing on the wall in SE. Um, and that is not, SE is never, ever catharsis, it's a little bit. So, and we do that when I'm noticing that there's activation, that they're able to notice that activation and push on the wall maybe for five seconds and then take a break, feel the feet on the floor. Okay. What do you think? Do you want to do that again? And people typically after two or three times, they're like, that's enough. And they, they notice a bit of a shift in their body. So it could be working on pressing out outward, especially if there was a physical trauma to the body, squeezing fists, pull, like pushing and pulling, noticing just a little bit, um, a little bit of muscle activation. And that uh, may- We had a hand up from- Oh, no, please, Amy, go ahead. And then uh, Ollie had a hand up feel safe. It's all really working with a person and the nervous system that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Yeah. make everything okay. It's all okay. There's no agenda on, on my part. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Ollie, it's good to see you, my friend. What do you, what do you got? Uh, um, can you hear me by the way? Yes. Oh, great. And um, you sort of answered part of it. So part of my work is working with um, university students, so 18 year olds, 90 year olds. Um, and so part of what you talked about just now um, with Christina was um, sort of really slowing things down and even just taking it off the subject of trauma completely. I was just curious about um, helping people with emotional literacy. So um, you guys are talking about really getting into the body. I'm just thinking of some of my students that just are so dysregulated, but not just that in terms of just even starting to understand some of the language, some of the words. So I was just thinking, what experience have you had with working with young people and and sort of what, um, what ways have worked in terms of working maybe with a younger demographic? I haven't worked with too many young people. Um, adolescents aren't aren't my demographic of work with. Um, I work with eighteen and older, but pretty much twenty yeah. and older. And yeah, so that's 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 how, in terms of university. Well, in the UK, like eighteen, nineteen, twenty, that kind of age. Yeah. Yeah, the people that I've worked with that I've done well with with somatic stuff there is a little there does tend to be a little bit of awareness but it's okay like it's all okay oh yeah. you're experiencing this and letting and noticing what words they use repeating mm. the word they use and then having them do you notice any bodies anything in your body right now as you're telling me this so that they can, so it's a holistic picture of what's happening. Oh. I, with my work, the words don't matter as much. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, 
it, it's really, I think meeting them where they're at and just knowing that over time, they're going to start to notice the differences. Yeah. Between between the differences in their their body and the the behaviors that the the want. <laughs> what does your body yeah. want right now? I don't know. That's or oh, like a lot of times I don't know. That's that's okay. Um, that's really helpful, actually. Just like, what does the body want to do? Kind of, where is your body trying to take you? What's your body trying to do right mm -hmm. now? And are you fighting it? it? That's actually really helpful. Just that word that wants what does it want to do I also look for body behavior like if the shoulder is going up I wonder if you notice that the body might be trying to get out of this mm. <laughs> they want to get out of this session and uh. that's okay um or noticing that they're they might be pulling back mm. It looks oh, like it's a, it's a good question to ask. What what does the body want if the body's keeping score? Yeah, please, Amy. Yeah, like it looks like your your body's might be even pressing against the chair a little bit. Can, is it okay to allow that to happen and to to notice? Maybe they need space. I've worked with clients on how far away I am from them, and it's all okay. Mm. And tuning into how they know. And, and what feels good and sometimes they like I don't know it just feels better but that's yeah. okay <laughs> yeah I'll stay way I'll stay back here that's okay mm. I know that gets a little bit off from, from your original question no 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 but no that's actually that's actually it, my mind's now going setting the set up of the rooms and and things and just in terms of just are, are our rooms allowing for that or do they think oh the chair's here so the chair has to stay here just even those things make a massive difference like of course like, they can sit wherever they want but do they know that and that's 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 a really interesting thing in terms of the body the way the body moves and that mm -hmm. so no thank you thank you so i'll speak about five minutes uh allison you were saying uh, uh emotion wheel or a mood meter uh, been helpful with with younger population yeah just in in terms of the emotional literacy or understanding like where exactly their feeling is falling uh because i had a client who didn't realize that frustration was a shade of anger and the fact that they made that connection was really impactful for them because them being defensive about not being angry was a whole other issue. And then to understand the fact that, oh, that's just a form of anger really changed how they approached handling it. And the mood meter is cool too, because it um, considers like the energy you're feeling too. Like, are you feeling very energized, but emotionally feeling low? And then you kind of find where you're at on the mood meter. I'll try to find a link and put it in before I have to go. One or two more questions. Um, we also had a comment here. Uh, Becky really wrote a nice comment here. I, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Becky, at all. Sorry, I have a cold. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to elaborate on it. I'm just really, 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 really grateful that you all are here talking about this and integrating it into your existing modalities because it is a huge missing piece for a lot of people and they haven't even known it existed. This little bit you wrote here, like the, the granular skills uh, for integrating the body and mind, uh, that really speaks to me. Uh, when you're over your cold, I would love to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about that because I, I feel this very strongly. And Dr. Thanks Marcus very much. Too, at least one of them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, last chance. Uh, come and get it. Last question or two. Don't be shy. 
Christine, Christina's back. <laughs> All right, go for it, Christina. Sorry right, again. Quicker question. Um, where would you direct me if I wanted to learn more about this? What are some websites or some books to learn more about somatic experiencing? I know Dr. Levine is a great resource, um, but also with the TRE, where would you point me? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'd say the first resource would be The Body Keeps the Score. If you haven't read that book, highly recommend it. Um, you can also visit, I'll put my, my website in here. I have a bunch of resources on there. Also TRE for all that's the worldwide website for TRE. That's an excellent website with a lot of different research on it as well. Um, but yeah, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to hop on a quick call and talk to you a little bit more about it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, traumahealingup.org is um, Peter Levine's somatic experiencing. I actually don't know the website for Safe and Sound Protocol. You could just Google it if you want more information there. Um, I can include my, I don't have resources, but I can include my website on in the chat if you're interested in reaching out. Um, I... Waking the Tiger is Peter Levine's book, and that's a really, really great introduction to the body and sensate and the importance of sensation. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually would love to snag a picture. For those of you who don't want to be in the picture, you can take your camera off, but um would love to make a quick little snapshot. So, okay. And also, uh, I will make the recording available. Uh, just keep an eye on my feed on LinkedIn. Okay, I'll make the recording of this presentation available. And please uh, share with others. Such I learned so much. I'm so thankful for you, you and Amy uh, here today, Sarah. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna take the screenshot really quick. One, two, three. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Great. All right. Well, I want to give uh, thanks to everyone. Um, keep an eye out. We have um, a presentation organized by my friend Chris Bradshaw on existential uh, psychotherapy, integrative psychotherapy. I'm so looking forward to that um, uh, with him on, I think it's 26. I can't remember. And then um, keep an eye out. We may throw a part two of this as somatic experiencing in DBT and uh, as always, um, I appreciate everyone for coming tonight after a long work day and holding the space here uh, and making this a safe space for us to speak and present and, and share our knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.